Hey everyone, welcome to this week's uh, Q&A session here at Local Marketing Institute. Uh, very special session for you this week. It's not often that we have uh, three platinum Google My Business uh, product experts on, all on the same broadcast, but we do today. So Ben, Jason, Joy, really glad to have you here. Hey everybody, happy Friday. It's my happy pleasure here. to be here. <laughs> And uh, just want to get it kick in here a little bit, uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get diving in. Uh, first of all, if you want to contact uh, Joy, uh, she's an amazing resource. Her and her team are up at sterlingsky.ca. Don't let the CA throw you. They are product experts and do amazing things in the United States and other places as well. Uh, and you can also find Joy at, at Joyanne Hawkins on Twitter. Ben is at steadydemand.com and at the social dude on Twitter. And Jason's at reviewfraud.org and at Kaiser Holiday on Twitter. Uh, and of course, I'm with Local Marketing Institute. So really encourage you to go out to our website, sign up for our email newsletter out there, get invites to these sessions and more. Um, Sign up for the podcast. All these sessions, including this one today, will come out on the podcast the Tuesday after these sessions. And if you're not part of it yet, go out and check out our Facebook group, Local Marketing Institute Connect. Uh, we're pretty restricted about who we add there. We try to very keep out a lot of the spammers and the, 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 the junk stuff out of there. Um, but we've got a lot of great people, including all three of our guests on here today are part of the group as well. Uh, I also do want to also encourage you to uh, check out localsearchforum.com. Uh, Joy and her team run Local Search Forum. Uh, it's a fantastic resource as well and highly recommend that you go check that out as well. Um, so before we dive in here, I wanted to just say, you know, first of all, a real quick thank you to, to you, Joy. Uh, for those of you who don't know us or haven't been following LMI for a while, Joy was one of my very first guests on Local Marketing Institute. I have to say, what was that, Joy? It was it five or six years ago, wasn't it? It was a while ago, yeah. It was a while ago. Things have grown, things have changed since then. Um, but uh, I'm thrilled to have Joy back on. And, and I guess Joy's had some influence on you as well, Ben and Jason. Yeah. So a little bit of trivia is that um, the reason that I actually became a top contributor back in those days um, was because of Joy. So it's her fault, by the way, that I'm here. Um, <laughs> I had a gun shop client that got removed from Google Maps and the supervisor and the, the support attendant both said that gun stores were going to be removed from maps completely and because they kill people, and uh, which sound logic, obviously, for Google. And uh, yeah, I was, I was totally upset. They were suspended and it was unjustified. And so I went to the forum. And at that time, and I raised the issue and Joy was uh, equally distressed. And uh, I found out later that she had actually escalated it and really fought for me actually uh, on my behalf and my client's behalf. And we got it solved and we actually changed policy and that opened my eyes. And I was like, holy crap. I was like, can I actually influence Google? Huh? This sounds cool. I, I, and I get to help a lot of people. Awesome. So, yeah. So, and then uh, after I joined the program, uh, Joy actually was also one of my mentors along with Mike and Linda. And um, it was really, it was great and got to learn how to do things and got really my hands around the industry. And then uh, last piece of trivia is, is that Joy and I were promoted to platinum at the same exact time. Um, yeah. So that was, uh, that was kind of cool too. So anyway, yeah. Thank you, Joy. We love you. <laughs> oh, so happy that uh, that happened then. <laughs> And I think we uh, we all also owe a, uh, a big thank you to Mike Mike Blumenthal, who's kind of the godfather of all this and has influenced all of us with this. So, Mike, if you're out there, thank you very much. We appreciate it as well. Um, hey, wanted to, to to dive in here a little bit and 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 get started. First of all, if you guys are do have questions for Ben, Jason, Joy, we have a lot of questions that were pre submitted. We'll be getting to as many of those as we can, but please use the Q and A function here on Zoom, and we will try to get to as many of those as we possibly can as well. Uh, Joy, before we kick off in just a general Q and A, did you have any real kind of hot topics or things that have got your attention right now in local search or Google My Business that you'd want to uh, talk about a little bit? Yeah, so we have an article coming out next week in our newsletter that's, I think, going to be really exciting. Um, Colin, who's one of my colleagues, who's also a Google My Business product expert, um, was doing this test on uh, his brother's listing. Um, so his brother is a paralegal, 
And he wanted to know if the identity attributes in Google My Business impacted ranking. So he's like, I'm going to mark my brother as a woman and uh, use the woman-led uh attribute on his listing because he figured this would be an easier way to figure out if that actually influences ranking since he's clearly not a woman. Um, so he tested it. Um, it actually did increase ranking for like female led businesses, women led businesses, like terms that were related to the attribute. So kind of cool to know since Google is actually highlighting that like earlier this week, they were highlighting on their homepage, like you went to google.com and it was like, search for women led businesses near you. So I can only imagine that that search volume is going to like skyrocket. So really important to have those attributes filled out, you know, if they apply to you, I'm not saying do it, Colin did with his brother, it was obviously a joke. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I was noticing this morning, actually, while I was uh, answering threads on the local search forum, is that there seems to be an increase in the amount of people that are complaining about listings just vanishing from their dashboard. So I know Ben was assisting somebody on the GMB forum and I was kind of following that thread. Um, but basically what's happening is like they're going in and the listings are just gone and they didn't remove them. Um, but Google support is saying, oh, it's a single user and that user removed themselves. And then the user saying, no, we didn't like, we didn't do this. So I'm not hundred percent sure what's going on here. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from Google. I'm going to be sending them a bunch of cases. Like the more volume we have of these, the better, because they can usually use that to identify what's going on. But if anybody's experiencing that, you're, you're not alone. Yeah. Post it, post in the forum because we definitely need to make sure that we bolster our case. So that way they Google can really see what's going on. Hence the dumpster fire. Yeah, I mean, the more it's, ammo it's, we have, it's it's better. And this this actually, by the way, is across all issues. If you can come in and you can show us an issue, we when we see volume and like when I say volume, we're talking like three to ten cases. Um, but when we see that, we act as kind of like an early warning system for GMB. So your contributions really do help. Yeah, and I just posted the the, the link to the uh, the GMB support form in chat. Uh, we'll post that with this webinar we got there. So definitely go out there and, and, and post that if, if, you, if you notice anything that'll help them uh, solve those issues here or at least identify them. Um, awesome. Well, let's dive into the Q&A. Uh, Joy, since you're our guest of honor, why don't you take the first one here? Um, first one question is from Megan. It says, uh, is it possible to actually reach 100% business profile completion? Uh, and what's the secret? Oh my goodness. Not currently. There's a bug currently that makes it stick at like 85%. And um, we, when we asked Google about it, they told us on a hangout that it's um, not going to be fixed till the end of the year. So um, no, but honestly, don't stress about it. That really doesn't matter. So you should be okay. It's a common question that we hear hear a lot, and you're right. It's it's don't worry about it. It's not going to be fixed at the end of the year. But everybody wants to get the, it's like that little red dot on your phone. You want to clear off all the dots and get it cleared out. So I, I understand. It, it's gamification network from Google. I mean, that's all it is. It's just trying to prod people along. But like Joy said, it doesn't import. It doesn't improve performance. So it's like eh, whatever. Okay. Um, also from Megan, the, the other question she had here is where are the changes in my GMB profile coming from? I'll update a field, for example, my website URL with UTM tracking codes in it. And next time in the account, it's back to my previous URL or out of the blue, a bunch of the redundant services will be added. Uh, Joy wants to take a stab at that one too. Yeah. So like nine times out of 10, it is a uh, tool that you've got hooked up to GMB. So common ones that I've seen are Yext, Moz Local, and SEMrush. So all of them have authorization. You give them authorization to your GMB profile, but if the data you have in GMB doesn't match there, it just flips right back. I think it's also a very important thing that I think a lot of folks don't realize that they may have one or multiple tools connected through the API to their GMB listing. And what you said, Joy, if I understand it right, if you've given those tools access, they have the ability to basically overwrite that data at any given point. So you may change it in GMB and then the tool goes back and says, oh, no, I'm going to re-overwrite it back to what I have. Yeah. So if you're going to authorize a tool, make sure you're updating it in that tool. Otherwise, don't authorize it. So otherwise, it'll just be confusing. Great. Yeah. great There's great, a little great. bit more to this, actually, if I can chime in really quick or for just to share some knowledge. Um, so as far as the services go, what that issue actually is very specific and it's a one time issue. Google's just basically trying to uh, suggest more types of services that you can use. And they also show up in the justification. So it's actually very useful. However, if you don't agree with them, just go ahead and remove them. 
again, Google's just pre-populated this. It has nothing to do with your website. Um, so just remove them and Google will not put them back, by the way. So it's a one-time fix. The secondary thing I just want to bring up really quick is a lot of people don't understand this and know this. What Joy said is 100% correct. However, there are different kinds of updates that you get. The first one is where it's going to be struck out completely. And then it's just going to, I'm sorry, it'll be a straight orange update. That's actually a Google update where Google saying, no, we think this data is this. That can actually be a citation issue. Um, if it's struck out in gray, that is actually a user's suggested edit. This can be discarded or it can be overridden. And then if you see struck out in orange, uh, struck out in orange means it is a suggestion actually coming from Google. And this can also be discarded. And the, oh. other, and the other thing is, is, if it is a data issue, then you have to go to GMB support directly to get them to fix the data on their end when they have to work with the engineering team. There we go. There we go. Um, Jason, why don't you tackle this one here? Uh, this is from Paul. It says, I have a couple of GMB listings for my, for my client. One verified listing was created. Uh, then another of uh, from the former business, my client had verified, changed the name to the existing business name. So now we have two of the same listings with the same name, but different reviews. How can I delete one without having the duplicate listing as temp or permanently closed? And how do I eliminate co customer confusion? Sure, so what you need to do is you need to um, get the CID for the duplicate, and then you need to remove all users from that duplicate, remove it from your dashboard, contact Google support with the live listing, with the, the one that you wanna keep, and then, have Google, and then have support merge those two listings. So they'll merge the claim listing and now the new unclaimed listing. But all they will do is just, is just merge the two listings and the reviews. Any photos that were uploaded, any Google posts will be will be gone. So you'll want to make sure that you can uh, somehow get a copy of those photos if you want to add them into the other uh, GMB. Otherwise, those are gone because those are only associated with the listing itself and can't be transferred. Great. And uh, should I share the, the link to the Bright Local Place ID generator tool? Eh, I don't know. Gatherups yeah. is nice. Tom's you can figure out. Awesome. You can figure out how to, how to get the CID. I just don't know that everybody knows how to get their CID, Jason. Sure. Yeah. Use, yeah. Just just install the GatherUp extension in in Chrome, and then you can get the places and the CID. There you go. Good. So the GatherUp extension, and uh, it'll it'll in Chrome. You can just pick, click it, and it'll show you the, the the CID for it. I've actually got that installed. I should should have should have demoed that, but that's okay. All right. Uh, so diving into here. Um, Ben, does sharing a GMB post to other social media help Google rankings, especially if a lot of people click on it? No. <laughs> now, basically, uh, that is actually the answer. The answer is it's not going to help. Um, there is no tie between social and local at all. Zero, zilch, nada. Um, however, if you've got a post which is actually doing very well, more than likely it's going to be commercial in nature. And would it hurt to put it on social media? No, it's not going to hurt anything. Uh, will it help anything? Maybe. I don't know. Test it. Joy, this brings up a, a question I think that, that, that we hear like a lot of folks ask you about, and that's linking to your GMB profile from various places. Do I link to, I link my, do I link to my, my GMB listing from ads or do I link to my primary website? Do I you know, repost social media and get links? In other words, I think people are thinking if I can get a bunch of clicks to my GMB listing from social media, from, from, from ads or from wherever, is that gonna help boost my ranking? Is there any data or any information you have to support that or deny that? Yeah, I'll, I'll find the article and throw it in the chat here, but um, we did a study on this. Like, so linking to your GMB listing might have a small, uh, short impact on ranking. Like we did see some slight movement, but then it, it, it went away. So it didn't stick long-term. So unless you're doing a lot of it um, from, you know, and when I say a lot of it, usually these practices are kind of spammy in nature. So like creating tons of YouTube accounts and linking to there and like you've heard of some of these tactics possibly. Um, I think they might work, but not long-term. And I think like link building is hard enough. Uh, if you're gonna do link building, 
do it for your site because that's going to help not just Google My Business. It's going to help organic. It's going to help organic anywhere else, like on Bing and DuckDuckGo or whatever. Um, like it stretches way further. And honestly, link building is tough. So like, it's not easy to just go get links unless you're getting garbage ones. And those ones don't really do a whole lot to move anything. Yeah, Jason, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I listen to all the, you know, the, the black hatters and they're like, you know, send bot traffic to your to your GMB. But uh, from what I'm hearing right now, it sounds like that tactic's uh, been shut down by Google. So I think Google uh, sussed it out. But yeah, it, like Joy says, and I say it all the time, don't build links to your GMB profile, send it to your website because you own your website. GMB is, is a rented property, so it's just rented space. But yeah, any links you build to your website, it's going to pay off in dividends if they are, you know, quality links. Great. And Joy just posted the link to her article in the chat. So check that out. Some more information on there. This ties a little bit to, uh, you know, a, a question of um, the GMB website. So we actually had a question uh, from a couple of different people who have submitted this about the GMB website. Should I create the GMB website? You know, obviously if, if for you who don't know this, within Google My Business, you have the ability to actually create a very simple website that's based on, primarily off of GMB data. Um, and should I, should I do that? Does it compete with my main, web, main website? And where should I link? Should I link my GMB profile to that site? Should I link it to my main site? And should I drive links to which site? So you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, Joy, why don't you just, let's start with you on that one. Yeah. So, I mean, for most of our clients, we don't bother because the GMB website doesn't rank very well. So for example, if we're dealing with a competitive space, like a dentist or a lawyer, even for a branded search, that site doesn't rank well. So we don't bother, but I have heard cases, you know, if you're in um, lesser competitive industries, it might help to create it because it's like an extra citation and it does get indexed and maybe rank for a branded term. But definitely, like I would say, if you're choosing between linking to your website versus linking to a GMB website, definitely link to your site. Like you can control way more when it comes to ranking. You can do SEO on your site. You can't do SEO on a GMB listing. Um, and like, I, sorry, I don't remember who said it, Ben or Jason said, like the, it's a rented space. You don't own it. So why would you, you know, they could shut it down like they did Google Plus. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> very, very true. I'll be a little bit contrary because I, we do actually uh, implement the, um, the GMB website for all of our clients because A, it doesn't take any time to do it. There's only one mistake that can occur and that's if you don't uncheck a box, right? That'll replace it, basically replace your, your domain with the GMB website. So as long as you don't do that, it's fine. I look at it like it's almost like an auto updating citation in a sense, because all of the information in GMB is going to update there, the posts, the photos, the reviews, all of that. And I also don't think it is a horrible idea to toss one or two links at it, maybe even internally from your own website, because it can actually rank decently for your brand name. And again, the, and not again, but the, the last thing is, is why I think this is valuable and why we do it for our clients is that we have actually had clients who have said, hey, we have had a conversion come from the GMB website because we'll use some UTM tagging, which you can add links to certain areas in the GMB website. And so, you know, even if it only drives one extra conversion, maybe a year, it's still worth it, especially if you're not paying for the links, but you shouldn't pay for links, by the way. I, I think from what we've all talked about for this about a long time, it doesn't hurt to create the GMB website. It doesn't necessarily help a whole lot. What I do, but I totally agree with all of you guys saying that if you're going to do any linking from social media, from ads, from anywhere else, link to your main website. That seems to be the, the unanimous uh, best practice here. The, um, I think the other question I, I had regarding the, the GMB websites is, I, it's not a question, it's an observation. It seems to be one of those things that's like, a lot of the snake oil salesmen out there will use GMB websites as kind of one of their, you know, their insider secrets that no one tells you about. And they'll iframe it in the, in the main website to try to create this Google authority link stacking, right? And are these Google cloud links service stacks that you'll see out there. Um, any legitimacy in any of that stuff or is it truly just snake oil? Snake oil. It's uh, it's that, that geo juice, uh, geos. Yeah, I was talking with somebody yesterday and they, they're paying 
$5,000 for this geostacking program on steroids and they have to do a six month com- uh, commitment. But the problem is, is every time we look at anything that these people are, are, are saying and doing, they're not just doing one thing. They're doing like several things. So you're never going to get an apples to apples comparison. You're getting apples to oranges. So they sit there and they'll say, oh, well, we sent a bunch of links to the, to the CID. And so that worked, or we sent a bunch of traffic to the CID by setting up ads, or we did this, we did X, we did. And so there's so many things they're doing and they're never just doing, you know, one off, you know, test results. And so when they sit there and they say, well, we've cracked the code to Google. And, and I think Mike Blumenthal has said, he's like, there's no silver bullets for instant rankings. It's always going to take time. It's always going to take efforts. However, with local, and Joyce said this, you know, repeatedly, you can see results a lot faster with local than you can with regular organic results. We've seen it work. So like I, there was a, there was a site we were tracking actually in Toronto for like, it was like SEO Toronto or something like that. And there was this really garbage Google site ranking and it was like fascinating. Like one of my colleagues, Yan was like looking through it, kind of uh, dissecting why it was ranking. And they were doing that like stacking thing. But what we noticed is that like over time, it just kept falling and falling and falling and falling. So it's like, yes, there are tactics that work that Google tells you not to do. We see it like every day. Um, you kind of want to pick and choose what tactics you're using based on like what's going to give you the best ROI. And I, I don't think using a tactic that works for like a month or two is good for ROI. So, yeah. Yeah. Beware and, of the snake oil salespeople. And, and I think I'm starting, I think I'm starting to see cases where some of this, this new found geo stacking is actually leading to account level suspensions or suspended listings too, which is, which I thought was quite interesting. So this one guy contacted me and when I was looking around, I was noticing that he was engaging in this, you know, this newfound, you know, geo stacking and, you know, base. And I mean, it didn't go any, it didn't go anywhere. Cause like, I didn't, you know, we couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't get to the, the bottom of, you know, signing the contract to figure out what was actually truly going on. But the more I was looking at it, it looked like all of these tactics were going to really truly prevent this listing from being reinstated. So like, you know, I guess it's just human nature. Everybody's trying to look for that silver bullet. They're trying to look for the secret, secret sauce, the insider code. And really what it boils down to is do the fundamentals, do them well, address specific scenarios as they, as they come up. And if, if you do that, you're going to solve 90% of the issues. Does that sound about right? Don't cut corners. Don't look for the magic bullet. It's not Just, there. Just think about the longevity of your business and how that is valuable to you. If you're a lead generator or whatever, don't yeah. do GMB. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's an interesting question. Uh, Joy, we'll start with you on this one here. Stephanie asks, we started receiving a significant wave of one-star reviews uh, from guests to our art exhibit who didn't understand the type and purpose of the experience we provide. Our non-traditional art exhibit focuses on photo. Um, this has stifled our overall review score. We're down to 2.5. Um, we're taking this as an opportunity to tweak our communications, uh, but what are some other solutions to this issue? How can we re- best recover our reputation in Google? Yeah, so unfortunately, Google wouldn't remove reviews like that uh, because they don't violate their guidelines at all. Um, So the only option really you have is to continue to ask for reviews. And then over time, you know, the average will go back up. And if you fix the problem, then you've kind of done the main thing that you can do. Yeah. I I would. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I would, I would actually love to, to take a look at that case. So if you want to reach out to me, um, I'm always, I'm always interested in these fringe cases to see if this is something that Google needs to do a policy update on, or if there really truly is something underlying that's, that's causing this. Cause sometimes it just may be, it may be a social share issue where somebody says, you know, go ahead and just attack his business and, and, and be there. Yeah. I was going to say that you had an idea. No, I was just going to say that um, I forget what the average is, but <clears throat> Mike actually Blumenthal put out a really good article, I believe, on this that explains what the average number of positive reviews that you would have to do to move your point score up. Um, because Google doesn't control that, by the way. It's done by a third party. So I don't know. Joy, Jason, do you know what that number is? I think it's like 10. Um, I have a uh, tool, I'll find it, that you can put in like the number of reviews mm-hmm. you have and it does the math for you. So it'll tell you, you need like five more five-star reviews to put your rating to this thing. I'll, I'll look it up here. Sweet. Yeah. 
And I know, and I know uh, the improv, whenever they would have Bob Saget come in, you know, people thought that it was Bob Saget from, um, from Full House. And they had to put disclaimers in there and says, this is a comedy show. This is not going to be family friendly. It's going to be raunchy and we will not issue refunds. And they had to actually do that on their ticket sales and at the, and at the, the window and, at, and as people were entering and leaving the club. So that way people knew, you know, this is what, what was to be expected. So it could be one of those things where you have to, you know, really, truly, you know, let people know what they're about to experience. Yeah. So I think Joy, you and Andy both popped in the, uh, the GoFish digital link there. Yep, Let me that's bring it. that up real quick. Um, it says so, Yelp, yeah, that, but it works That link's out there. Um, interesting, though, I'm, I'm kind of curious, is that really an algorithm or is, it, or is it just basic math? I mean, for, for example, you know, if you've I, – I, I'm, I'm a road biker, and I, I'll look at my – let's say my average is 18 miles an hour. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to really push hard. So this, so I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, push at 20, 22 miles an hour here for the next two miles. I'm really push hard, push hard, push hard. And I look at my average has only gone from 18 to 18.1. I'm like, why? Well, because for the past 30 miles, I've been averaging 18 and I can't expect two to crank that up and all of a sudden get my average. So I, I, I saw this in another forum where a guy was saying, Hey, um, you know, one, you know, one, one star review took my, re- my reviewing from, from, from 5.0 down to 4.3. Then I got two more five star reviews and only went up to 4.4. What's the deal? I'm like, basic math. <laughs> <laughs> it looks yeah, like it is basic math, by the way, if you view the source. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I looked at a I looked at a business that had uh, three one star reviews, but he still had a 5.0 rating. Um, cause he had, a, he had 150 reviews. So, I mean, it, it is, it is some, you know, some special, you know, third party. That's math. math there. That's math. Um, all right, this is another good one here. Um, kind of related to staying in the review vein here. Uh, Sharon asks, how, how should I best respond to a bad review? I seem to see a lot of conflicting information about that, specifically this kind of review. And there was a person who said the review uh, was and I want to put some context around this because the person, the reviewer's name was, I hate Karens, okay, and um, the review was said this woman, sp- speaking about the person, is a Karen. She's a narcissist, avoid at all costs. It was a one star review in this business. Was this a legitimate review? Is there a chance that this could get removed? I think there is a chance it could get re- 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 removed. So first thing to do is to flag it. And then come to the Google My Business community forum and hope that a product expert, you know, was able to see it and escalate it over directly to Google. Um, I like taking on all review cases in the forum because that's kind of my my thing. I love that. Um, but yeah, when it comes to responding to this review, uh, you want to reply in a polite and professional manner. Remember, you're not just addressing the reviewer, but you're addressing your potential customers. Everybody's going to read that review and know that this person has some personal beef and they're going to discount the, the text of that review. But you also want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. And so you want to be like, hey, you know, I'm so sorry that you had a, you know, had a problem. You know, please reach out to us if you would like to uh, discuss this, you know, further. So that way you look like you are the better person, right? You've kept that level head. If you were to go back and say, yeah, you're calling me a Karen, you're a Karen, and you start slinging mud, well, then it's just going to add more credence to that review and it's going to do a lot worse. You're going to do yourself a lot worse and, and, and put yourself in a bad light. Joe, you want to come on to the link you just put in there? Yeah, this is Mike Blumenthal's uh, article. It's like super old, but I reference it all the time. So those are the steps we follow. Um, I'm also looking up a thread uh, that was on the local search forum that's hilarious that gives examples of bad responses. It's really oh. entertaining. So I'll find that and post it as well. I, oh, I, just, yeah. did one, I just did one of those on, um, God, what was it, Gather Up? Yeah, so there, there's some good ones out there. There's a local search forum. And then I also put the one that we, we have an article on this as well that we wrote. So bottom line, some, some good advice out there. Um, but unless it flat out violates Google's guidelines or you can prove that it was a fake you can prove it was a fake review it's difficult to get it removed well and then this could also be one of those cases where you can actually sue them for defamation because they called you a narcissist so they actually took it a step further from just saying that you had a bad experience but they're actually name calling and then that's for you but it costs money to do that it does and there's there uh, something about the battle and the war be willing to lose the battle and win the war on some of this stuff mm-hmm. i'll leave yeah. that as it is 
I don't know if you guys, I did a uh, article recently for Search Engine Land and that's a case in Michigan where a lawyer sued for uh, reviews from his competitor. And it was interesting. I actually read through the court documents and um, they were able to prove the identity of a lot of the reviews. So I guess throughout the case, those got removed, but there was one where they couldn't prove the identity. And the judge actually ruled that like, they weren't going to take it down. They're like, even if it was a competitor, because there was no text in the review, they decided that a one-star review with rating with no text was not against the law. Like it's crazy. I'll, I'll grab the link for that one too. Yeah. That's a great case. Yeah, excellent yeah. one. Uh, here's a great question. Uh, JB, why don't you tackle this one? Can we update the located in section? in a GMB listing. Um, again, is for, for, I, I, if you haven't seen it, sometimes you'll do a listing and we'll say located in this particular shopping center or this particular other building. So is that editable? Well, not by users. It used to be, you used to be able to, to do that directly on GMB when you were logged in and you could add that you were located in, you know, such and such shopping center. Uh, or if you were added incorrectly to the wrong place, you could, you know, do a suggested edit to, to remove it and put it in the right spot. That actually hasn't worked for over a year now. Um, so what you have to do is you have to actually contact uh, GMB support to get help and have them go ahead and remove it. Uh, they can e they can easily do it, but yeah, I don't. We don't know why Google is not allowing us to do edits to add it or remove it. Um, but it it hasn't worked. Joe and I were working on a, a case once where a business was actually put a block away and across the street, and we had to go directly to Google because we just couldn't do it. It was just that it was crazy. Um, Joe, let's tackle this one here. Uh, is it okay to use your home address or PO box on your website? if your GMB is set up as a service area business? I mean, technically, yeah. Uh, home address is totally fine. That's up to you if you want to make your home address, you know, public information. Um, PO Box, I say, is a little risky in the sense that, like, if somebody saw your website, they might try and report you. That being said, it, it likely won't um, actually result in anything because Google can see what what uh, address that you used on your listing. But I would say like, if you are gonna put a PO box on your website, just be clear, like this is our mailing address only or something. Yeah, we had it. I was sorry, gonna say, you, go ahead, Jay. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, we had, we had an issue last night where a guy came in and uh, they had their PO box listed on their website and they were being impacted by the Kansas bug. Well, we couldn't help them fix the Kansas bug until, until they actually told us on the public forum what their private residence was that they were using for their for their, uh, for their GMB listing. And even when we contacted Google, Google actually had a different address that they were seeing that was supposed to be associated with the listing too. So it can lead to a lot of confusion when you do it that way. Yeah, I will say this. One of the best practices is if you have a service area based business, then do put down your service area, your primary service area, which is the city and the zip code in which you're actually verify that. Um, that's the only reason for that is, is basically because Google does integrity checks where they will scan the website. They'll look for that on your contact page or on your footer, et cetera. And so if it's there, you have a better chance of, well, I don't know, not getting suspended sometimes. And again, just to, to clarify, we're talking about the, the address on the website, not the address they put into Google My Business. And if I'm understanding right, you're saying that, hey, there are cases where having the address be the same that you're using in both, even though the service area business, it's hidden on GMB, helps if there's any problems because they can they can then validate those two together, right? Pretty but much. there's a lot of, I think, you know, service area businesses that maybe they do operate out of their home and for a public facing mailbox, they want a PO box. For GMB, they may have actually used their home address behind the scenes, but there's a service area, so not violating the terms and conditions. What about that scenario? Is that is that scenario okay? I mean, you can put whatever you want on your website, right? So the right. only thing that could technically get you in trouble is what you use for the address inside GMB. But um, I don't think there's any issue having a PO box on your website as long as you clearly say this is just where to send mail. I think I agree. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move on from that one. Uh, here's an interesting one, a bit of a niche case, but I think it has some, some wide ranging applications here. Um, so this is written in from Molly. It says the European Christmas market is a nonprofit outdoor holiday market held each year on Union Depot's property located in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. 
The mailing address for the market has been their home office, but that's not the same as the market's physical location. How can I reinstate the GMB listing for the market at the, at the uh, Union Depot property? So the solution here, and this applies to anything where you don't get mail at your physical location, you still have to put your physical location as the address on your listing because that's where you need the pin to be, especially if it's a market, like people have to show up. Um, you won't get the pin, obviously, when it's mailed. Um, so unfortunately, it's processing is going to take about 14 to 28 days. So it's a little annoying, but you have to request a pin. When it doesn't arrive, request a second pin. And when that doesn't arrive, you can contact GMB support and they can do a manual verification. It's just lengthy, but once you're verified, hopefully you should be okay. Yeah, yeah but well, it was already suspended. The other, the other thing is, though, in this case, it's probably not going to get reinstated. And the reason is, is that while so seasonal businesses are allowed, you're not allowed to really list your event as a GMB profile at somebody else's business. So you don't have authority over that location. So therefore, you don't get a GMB. I believe I'm correct on that, right, Troy? I think it depends because there's like an auto show, for example, that goes on annually. So if it's, an, it's a reoccurring annual event, they do allow it. Mm -hmm. If it's a one-time event, they don't. Right. I, this is where I think there was some gray area here that uh, th this is something that sounds like, like it's a traditional thing that happens every year. It's part of the St. Paul landscape. And, um, you know, anyway, I, I wanted to know one about the can other certain kinds of events that are not a non-owned property that can indeed be verified as a legitimate GMB listing. And uh, I'm going to say, go to, I'm going to say in this, in that case, go either contact one of the three of us or go to the GMB forum and let us escalate it up to Google. Cause I mean, if Joy's saying that there, that there, that there is a chance, I mean, let's, let's at least, you know, do what we can to see if we can, you know, get it reinstated. Let's try it. So like dumb and dumber. So you're saying there's a chance. Right. Hi, Mike. Anyway, the other thing was those seasonal businesses. And that is the fact that seasonal businesses are, are allowed within the GMB guidelines, correct? Yep. yep. You just have to make sure, you have to make sure that you close them when they are closed and it's out of season, right, Joy? Yep. Okay. Um, ben, let's kick this one off to you here. Um, I have a independently owned and operated franchisee. Um, how should I manage my GMB listing? My take is it's not the same thing as an additional location of, of, of a business. So the franchisee's GMB should be their own, not owned and controlled by the franchisor. Is that correct? So <clears throat> there's a couple of different schools of thought on this. I'm just going to go based on my experience. And that is, is that when you have the franchisor and the franchisee relationship, you have an agreement with, that you have with the franchisor. And if the franchisor states that you will handle your own marketing, then you, in a sense, could go ahead and create the GMB listing by yourself. I have a, quite a few franchises I work with that do that. However, uh, in other cases, I work with franchisors that do control the marketing for the franchisees and they create the listings, even though the franchisee will go ahead and manage those listings. Sometimes it's, again, it's sometimes it's included in their marketing agreements. Um, so that's when the franchisor would actually have control. And uh, Jason, JB, you got some thoughts on this too, I know. Yeah. So uh, when it comes down to a dispute over over ownership of the listing, Google is going to side with the fran with the franchise or so they they are always going to side with the biz with the with the brand. And we had the, we had this issue uh, a couple times come up where we were trying to help uh, you know with uh, you know with a uh, with, you know with with franchises and they were trying we were trying to get access so that we could update the the website URL and we could add you know tracking numbers. And Google ended up uh, removing all of our listings and marking all those duplicates. And we went round and round months and months trying to get that. And then we also had a case where we actually had a franchisee uh, that uh, we took to, they, the corporate took to, co to court uh, and we were trying to get access to the GMB and actually went to the GMB team and said, look, the, these need to be unclaimed. We need to kick all the, all the owners out. Uh, because it belongs to the brand and the, the, the business is not giving up access and they end up kicking, kicking, the, kicking them all out. And then we took over the access because it belonged to the brand. All right. Any thoughts on that, Joe? You want to move on to the next one? 
No thoughts on that, but I, I was like messaging one of my um, friends who's a map products expert about the, the reoccurring show thing. He also wanted me to add that it has to have history. So in order for you to get the listing um, live, if it's historically been like every year, then you'll be fine. But if you're like, oh, here's this new event and it's going to be every year, you will have a harder time. That makes total sense. They're, they're just trying to establish the legitimacy of something. Yeah, that's good. Uh, okay, here's a, here's a fun question. Joy, I'll throw this out to you. Uh, this is from, from Gavin. Local link building. I want to believe in it. It makes sense. But does anyone have any studies or proof or stories of the impact that local links actually have on rankings? Yeah, so, um, I mean, links definitely impact rankings. I can say that with certainty. We do a lot of link building um, at my agency. But uh, the, the coolest representation of it I've seen was Darren Shaw um, did a presentation at MozCon, I think 2019, because it was in person. Um, and he showed this brand new business that never had a website and then showed like all the increases to ranking as he did various things. So when he got to the point where he built a few links, you see this like giant increase in ranking. But what he showed, which I thought was really fascinating is the second batch of links he built after that did not have the same impact. Like it didn't have that giant spike. So I think with link building, like it's important, but you definitely will see more of an impact from like the beginning parts. Like if you get a really good link, then necessarily what you won't see that like continue to increase at the same rate, if that makes sense. I'll share a quick story. I think I've shared it on the LY before, but that is, is I ran about a three-year experiment with steady demand in which I just had a GMB profile. I did nothing with it except for posts basically and all the general optimization, but I just left it alone. Um, and it didn't rank at all, by the way. I mean, it's like every once in a while it would rank for Gmail, you know, and uh, <laughs> long reasons behind that one. Anyway, um, however, I did go to invoke the name of Darren again. Uh, <laughs> I did go ahead and buy some local links um, through Darren through WhiteSpark and only did five. We're talking a $25 investment, by the way. So uh, once those links were built out, I actually started seeing queries inside of Google My Business Insights. And we're talking like about 50 queries. And it was starting to pick up all sorts of things that I had been building over the years, um, you know, with steady demand. So, and it was finally getting picked up. Local links is actually what moved the needle. Yeah. And I think it's also an interesting thing because local link building is linking back to your website. And people want to know, well, does that impact my GMB listing? And mm -hmm. the answer I think that we've all seen is that, yes, it does, because you know, Google is looking at the overall authority of your brand as a whole. And so the links to your website actually do have a secondary benefit in impacting your GMB listing. Am I correct? Correct. Yep. And, I, and, I've, and I've said it time and time again, you know, and Joy's done studies where depending on how you're optimizing your GMB, like what page you're linking to on your website and how your website is optimized and anything you are doing with your website will always have ripple effects with your GMB listing and they'll pay off dividends, especially with Huge. local link building. I had a, you know, we had a franchise, they opened up a location, it was struggling for a while. We said, hey, why don't you go and do some local sponsorships? They did a bunch of local sponsorships. And next thing you know, they started dominating their market and they shot completely up and, and dominated their market. So it, it does work. It, there, there is, there is, there's a reason why we say, do these local links, get in the chamber of commerce, get with the BBB, do local sponsorships, get your name out there. Like it all pays off. It's, it's all that, that marketing, like that thing I shared in local, you know, in, in LMI, you know, this week about that one prank, but you saw how that, that prank paid off dividends just by doing marketing. And then they used it for, for good. So, yeah. All right. I'm going to try to go here to, to, uh, to a rapid fire round here, if we can, to get through as many questions as we possibly can. All right. We'll round Robin it here. Joy, what's the best practice for GMB profile short names? <laughs> whatever you want. They really don't matter. Like, I mean, yeah, whatever you want. There we go. Short answer. <laughs> right. So keywords in the short name have no impact whatsoever. No. Don't worry about it. Um, okay. And we've talked about before, is it best to link to, you know, for reviews to a short name or to a CID or to whatever, any thoughts on that? Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Okay. Short names. Right. Easier to remember. Faster. Yeah. CID. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, here, and, and if you, something about a joke of if, if you get three platinum GAB experts in a room, what are they all going to say? Um, are citation building services worth it? Jason, go. Yes, they are always be worth it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. But don't like get a thousand citations, get just the basic set. Gotcha. And guys, I know you know, a lot of questions out here. We have literally a queue of about 30 questions. We'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. We're trying to rip through them as, as fast as we can. Uh, yes, citation building service is worth it. Ben, your thoughts on citation building services as a one-time event or as an ongoing service? One-time event, if your address changes, go ahead and change appropriately. Joy, any comments on that? Yeah, so the only time that I've seen um, a reason to do YEX would be for big ticket items. Um, so if your average sale is, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, like a lawyer, or even a car, like a car dealer, um, sometimes it does make sense to have YEX. Like, it's it's not one of those things that I'm strictly against. We've seen um, some benefits from doing that. But if you're not in that boat, then usually it's a lot cheaper to just do manual. Okay. Or if you're, or if you're, multi, or if you're managing multiple locations for the same brand, and next thing you know, you got you know, three hundred plus locations. It makes sense, especially if you have to change hours on the fly when it's seasonality. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I want to go back on the short name real quick. Andy had a had a great comment in there. Hey, Andy. Um, his comment was he always recommends for short names on your GMB profile. Keep it on brand, like match your Twitter handle for example. I'm like, I think that's absolutely the right way to go, in my opinion, if you can do it. Um, all right. J ben, let's ask you a quick question from, from Paul. With categories, I have one primary category and one secondary in Google My Business. Additional cat categories that are suggested beyond the extra one always disappear. Why? <laughs> You look to any kind of tool that you might have connected to GMB that might be uh, Yext, Moz, SEMrush, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, they are, if they're connected to GMB, they are the source of truth, quote unquote. So therefore, they might just be overwriting your categories. It's not going to be from a suggested edit. It's definitely not going to be from Google. So I, I would look there. Yeah, he followed up and said that GMB offers up to 10 categories, but they never show or seem to be reflected anywhere. Yeah, well, if you filled them in, they're... Absolutely there. You can do right. searches. I mean, do a test and add pet sitter. And I'm sure you'll rank for a pet sitter in one way or another. Also, what you can just do is go use a tool like Plepper or GMB Spy. And you know what? When you go to your listing, you will go ahead. Yes, bird eye too, by the way. And uh, but yes, use those tools and it'll show you all the categories and the subcategories. Okay. Uh, here's a great one from, from Jeffrey. Joy, let's tackle this one. Do you know what factors play into Google marking a review as the most relevant? Huh. Oh, that, that's a million dollar question. Um, no, I mean, like nobody really knows for sure, <laughs> but my assumption has always been um, interaction, right? Like if people are clicking on a review or reading a review a lot, I think that's what Google's looking at. But honestly, like, yeah, none of us really know. I've seen some evidence as well that it seems to be that it's also, if the review is also related to what the person was searching for, that that seems to sometimes boil, bubble up a little bit higher. Have you seen that at all? Not sure. I'm saying like for review justifications, yes. When they put the little snippet in the local results, it definitely is matching the query for sure. Right. I'm not sure if I've seen that on the like most relevant. Uh, we've tried to influence that. We've done various testing, never gotcha. been successful. So it's, it's brutal. It's hard. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, here's a tough one, a bit of a sensitive one, but I'll throw it out there. Jason, I'll let you tackle this one since you're Mr. Sensitive. Um, what is, is there anything being done about negative reviews that were left on nursing homes or hospitals during COVID where people unfortunately died? Are any of these going to be allowed to be appealed for removal due to, due to extenuating circumstances? Yes, definitely. Um, as if it was, uh, if it's any situation, and this is not just going to be for nursing homes or for review attacks, anytime that a story goes viral in the press, you can use that to contact Google to get those reviews removed. And when they're able to show that it was in conjunction with bad press, 
uh, a la the, the Red Hen Lexington, where they kicked out Sarah Huckabee Sanders, when you're able to show them that it's, you know, because of something going viral, uh, you're going to have a higher likelihood of having those reviews removed. So go to the GMB forum. I uh, hope one of us get it or, you know, reach out to me. I, I love those cases. Those are my faves. Okay. Um, uh, ben, here's a great one for you. I'm not sure you know the answer, but I'll throw it out there. Carolyn asks, I think it's legitimate. Why are there so many bugs in GMB? <laughs> answer that then <laughs> do we have an hour for this one holy crap excuse my french um so <clears throat> all right so i'm gonna play devil's advocate on this and go both sides um number one it's very frustrating when gmb has a uh, dumpster fire of features that is for see there he goes so um yes and which they do and the other thing is is that to be fair to GMB. There are a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things going on. And sometimes they're rapid firing and trying to get features out as fast as possible. A great example of this was when, when the coronavirus hit and they started adding features literally every single week. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as they added the temporarily closed, it broke. And for multiple reasons. However, they were very agile and they did fix it. Then again, there is the flip side of this equation where there are problems like the Kansas bug, which is still not fixed and support is still not very trained on it. Um, They're working on it, but it's just not fixed. And that can be frustrating as a merchant and it's also frustrating as a consumer, um, but they have to prioritize. They only have so many resources. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. And I'm just going to say one other thing. It's code upon code upon code upon code. So each time that they have a new code come in, it's being put on top of another code. And so it's uh, stressing the system and exploiting issues in other code. And so you got to think about, you know, as you're trying, you, you know, you're not building something completely from scratch. You're trying to add something on top of other things that are already put in place. And then when you have a patch and if it breaks that patch and et cetera. Oh, um, let's hear Joyce answer on this one. Yes, I have nothing to add on that. Like you, you nailed it. It's a free product too. I think people forget that. So, you know, Good point. <laughs> limited resources. It is a free product, but you know, they've gone down to the three pack to the two pack because they're kind of pushing it more toward a, uh, Never mind. I won't say that. Yeah. Don't go there. I won't go there. <laughs> Conspiracy um, theorist. Here's a, here, here's a great one. Jason, I'll throw this out to you here. Um, I've seen other Facebook GMB groups talking about CTR manipulation and other gray tactics. Obviously, these tactics seem to be frowned upon, but what are your thoughts? So many people are talking about doing these things out there. <laughs> you didn't see because Ben was off camera, but he just flipped off the camera. He did not. No, he shot. No, he shot. No, he, I shot he, myself he shot in the head. Oh, I thought you flipped off the camera. I only saw no, you when you bring your no, hand no, down. No, no, no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so so if you okay, so what is what is the value you're going to get out of using these CRT you know uh, tactics? Is it going to increase? Is it going to increase your conversions on your website? Is going to can, can, uh, increase your your leads, your traffic, and that stuff? No. Does it look not? Does it look nice in, in Google Analytics? Does it look nice in in GMB where you get all this traffic coming in? But if you're not making any money off of it and there's no payoff for it, what is the point of trying to manipulate these metrics if you are not making money at the end of the day? And for all the time, money, energy, and resources you're spending on this stuff, you could have done some uh, some PR blitz campaign, some uh, email marketing, some social marketing, paid ads that would actually would have gotten you uh, gotten you sales and leads. So we talk about this a lot internally. Like this has come up in so many of our meetings at Sterling Sky. Uh, one thing I can say for sure, C uh, so click-through rate manipulation, I think somebody asked, like, what does CTR stand for? So it's the act of artificially inflating your, your click-through rate. So you're telling people, go search for this and click on me. Um, it works. It works very well. Um, so I can say that with certainty. The, the problem is that it, it, it's tricky to do it, but usually if you're doing it to kind of trick Google, over time, their system realizes that what's normal does not match what they saw in that time period. So if you're not continually doing it forever, um, the likeliness of it sticking is very low. So normally it takes a while to make it the impact. It's not immediate. 
And then you'll kind of see it stick for a bit and then it'll drop back down to what it was before. So I've, I've, I've monitored businesses that are doing this very closely to kind of watch the trends. The analogy I use is that it's, it's a drug. It mm-hmm. may work short term, but then you've got to keep using. You've got to keep, you've got to keep mm-hmm. feeding it to keep the effects going. And then of course you run the risk of an OD or you run the risk of getting, getting caught in this case or something else happening. So I guess it goes back to what I think we talked about earlier. Guys, stop trying to find the tricks and the manipulations and the secret sauce and all the other things you see in all these Facebook ads. Ignore that and just do the fundamentals, do them well and execute well and work hard. That's going to have the best long-term results for your business. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> um, preach it, preach it, preach it. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, here's a good one here from Terry. Our previous administrator for our Google My Business account has left. How do I change the email to get the reports? I think there's a bigger question is how do you get access to that administrator account? Right? Joe, you want to tackle that one? Yeah. So um, if you're trying to get access to the account, that's a different question than if you're trying to get access to the, the GMB listing. Um, getting access to the GMB listing isn't difficult. There's a process for it. You basically try to claim it. They contact the existing owner. When they don't respond, Google lets you claim it. So it's it's fairly straightforward. I think it takes like depending on what type of business you are, it'll take anywhere from um, seven to 14 days usually. Um, if you're trying to get access to the account, that's trickier because they usually it def- deflects back to like your backup phone number and things like that. So you may need to um, go to the Google accounts forum. It's a different forum than the GMB forum. Great. I think to answer the person's qu- uh, qu- other question, part of that question is, is that if I remember correctly, the owner is absolutely going to get insights. Um, I believe managers will sometimes get the insights report. Hmm. Okay. I don't believe it's very consistent though. Bottom line though, I think your point's uh, accurate there, Joy, is hey, if it's access to the GMB listing or it's access to the actual account and either way you, you got it, you can, you can address one of those issues if you need to. Yeah. Um, got time for maybe squeaking a couple more questions here. Um, Joy, you did, I think you actually did this once since so I'm going to throw this out to you. I'm noticing some companies this is from Kevin. I'm noticing some companies adding emojis in their GMB mm-hmm. names. It makes the listing stand out, but would it be against the guidelines? It is against the guidelines, whether or not Google enforces it is another story. So, I mean, like your risk of suspension is very low in my opinion. Um, but usually what ends up happening is like users on maps will suggest an editing, get rid of it because people are like, oh, that shouldn't be there. So it, it's, it's not super sticky, but honestly, I feel like it's a pretty low risk of getting a suspension if you want to add an emoji. Unless you have multiple, unless you have multiple locations and then you would be looking at an account level suspension. Cause I actually saw, I actually know a lawyer who actually added some emojis to their listing a couple years ago and through the redressal form, they got suspended. I will say this, add Unicode to your description any day, as long as you want to get suspended. That's why I threw the yep. Unicode thing in the chat yep. Yep. with that here. All right. And the last, last but not least here for today, by the way, guys, if we didn't get to your question, we will put them in the queue and we'll, we'll go at them next week for this as well. I don't know if Joy will probably won't, won't be joining us then. We'll have her back again though sometime, uh, but we'll definitely try to tackle as many as we can. So Joy, we'll leave this from you. It's from our good friend, Andy. Uh, how would someone know if they have a hard or a soft suspension? Yeah, so a hard suspension is, by the way, this isn't a Google term. This is just a term that the SEO community came up with. A hard suspension is when your listing is gone. Like it's nowhere on Google Maps. You can't find it. Um, If you had a link to it, that link pulls up a dead page. Uh, Soft suspension is when we refer to like the listing is still exists on Google Maps. It still ranks. You just no longer have the ability to manage it inside Google My Business. So it would appear as unclaimed on Google. There you go. There you go. Well, guys, I, 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 we could probably go for another hour or so here, but I want to be respectful of our guest time. And uh, thank you for all your time. We really appreciate it here. These recordings do come out next Tuesday, uh, but, and they also come out on the podcast. So, so check it out for there. But thank you all so much. And Joy, thanks for joining in with us. It, as a pleasure, as always, always love having you on. Ditto. This is fun. Jason, thanks, Ben, Drew, have Mike. a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk to you all next week. Bye, all. It was my, it was my pleasure.